Welcome to Bible Believers Fellowship and the ministry of BBFOhio.com as we conclude this message from our brother named John Bales who traveled in from Canton, Ohio to preach this message titled Eternal Security. This is part two of a two-part message and we encourage you to follow along in your King James Bible as Brother Bales finishes our study titled eternal security. It says, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost <clears throat> and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. But we'll get back to this and give you the real explanation. But they use that as a, as, a, as a proof text to say that if you sin and you fall away from Jesus Christ, you cannot come back, that you're damned. I had a guy the other day ask me, he goes, you know, I believed in stuff, uh, uh, you know, but I, I kind of fell away. What do I do? And I told him, well, you just go back to God. But if I was an Arminian that believed this, I'd have to say, well, there ain't much you can do. I mean, you're going to go to hell anyway. <laughs> I mean, that, that's what they would have to tell him. They believe you can lose your salvation and never get it back. If somebody comes to you and says, I fell away for a time, I want to come back to God, you would have to look them in the eye and say, you're going to hell and there's nothing you can do about it. But of course it's not true. So, Amen. Uh, All these, the holiness people, the people who believe you have to, that uh, you can uh, lose your salvation, believe you have to continue, endure to the end. They've taken... Uh, one thing you'll notice about heretics is they cherry pick verses and they take them out of the context in which they were supposed to be. Like this in Hebrews chapter 6 is an example. <clears throat> like, that's what I told you. If you're walking down the street and you have the thought of uh, maybe poisoning your neighbor's dog, uh, if you get hit by a car before you confess that, um, uh, you, you struggle with those thoughts, <laughs> but they, they, but if, but they say, you know, if if you if you if you're thinking wrong and you die before you confessed it, you're going to hell. They believe you can lose your salvation. So Colossians two thirteen, and Colossians three thirteen. Remember thirteen. It's good for once. Two and three. Let's turn there because I mean you really got to get these down. These are good verses to get down. Now, I always hear bits and pieces of different beliefs and stuff, and it's always hard to get a certain name tag on them and who it is that identifies what they identify themselves with that believe it. But has anybody ever heard of the teaching that talks about, uh, yeah, you know, your sins were forgiven uh, before you were saved, but now that you're saved, you got to confess, and you got to confess those sins to be forgiven, and you got to repent. And if you don't do that, and you sin, you're dying, go to hell. Well, there's some people that believe that, but according to Colossians two thirteen, it says, "And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together together with him, having forgiven you some trespasses, having forgiven you the trespasses that you confess." No. All trespasses. Amen. All is all. Amen. All means the ones that you're aware of. The ones you purposely committed. The ones you're not aware of. The ones that you tried to do right so much, but you still ended up sinning. Those ones are forgiven. The ones that you confessed are forgiven. The ones you did not confess are forgiven because he's forgiven you all trespasses. Now, let me uh, freshen up here, uh, ask another survey question. Does it seem like I'm trying to get anybody to justify sin? I mean, come on, be honest. I'll give you a dollar. <laughs> All right, because that's not what I'm trying to do, so I want to make sure that uh, nobody gets that idea. Salvation is not dependent upon your ability to keep track of your sins. Amen. These people that believe you can lose your salvation when you sin, what about the ones you don't know about? Come on. See, uh, uh, you get one of these guys that claims, oh, I haven't sinned in 20 years. Well, let's follow you around for a little bit, okay? Let's, let's go on vacation and see how you do. <laughs> I, I was just listening to, um, it was David Hoffman. 
uh, he was doing a sermon and he said that uh, there's this guy that claimed to have never sinned in so long. So he had him come into the church after the service one time and, and teach and stuff. And uh, he said it was interesting because there was five guys that came with them and none of their wives came. Why? Because they're wives. <laughs> hey, uh, is your husband sin? Uh, yeah, yep. Yeah. <laughs> so we can't bring our wives or find us out. <laughs> Probably the same guys that believed you could whip your wife, too. Yeah. <laughs> Salvation, plain and simple. It's not of works. Can't earn it. Right. Only of grace. Grace. Now, remember, grace is God's uh, unmerited favor. Unmerited means you cannot earn it. You cannot, there is not enough good in this world to do to earn God's favor. Right. It's given by faith. That means you believe. You trust in Christ. You believe in his death, that he shed his blood, that he was buried, and then he rose from the dead. When you fully trust that, as the song says, when you fully trust that and fully believe that, that's when you're saved. Amen. Amen. Salvation is not cleaning up. There's plenty, plenty of uh, people out there that gave up booze, they gave up meth, heroin, cocaine, opiates, marijuana, that are still going to hell. Right. It's not enduring to the end. You can, you know, these people clean up. They drink 20, 30 years, and they die sober. They gave it up, and they died sober, but they're still in hell. It's not continuing in the faith. There's a lot of people that think, Going to church, reading the Bible, being faithful, this and that, is going to save them, and it's not. It's not confessing your sins. There's many of people that uh, when they get under conviction, they're telling God, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, let me live, let me live, what not. That's not salvation. That's not, that won't save you. Don't get that idea. Premise four is the Bible believer, and that is you're secure no matter what. Now, that is by no means a justification for sin. Uh, Titus chapter 3, I think, verse 5, it says, uh, The grace of God hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness, we should live righteously, soberly in this prayer. Don't quote me, but that's about how it goes. Uh, Romans 6, 1 says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. There's no, there's, there's no justification for sin. When a believer sins, he's guilty. Amen. You go to God and you tell him, I sinned, there's no excuse. Forgive me. Oh, he's forgiven you, but confess it. Restore that fellowship. If salvation could be lost, it would not be called eternal life. Amen. Amen. Now, here's the catch with these Armenians. They say um, eternal life is eternal life, whether you have it or not. So God can call it eternal life. But let me ask you something. He said, Jesus said, I give unto them eternal life. Why would he give you something if it's not, and call it eternal life if it's not? Why? Yeah, yeah, it's deceptive. It's a gimmick. A Christian is part of the body of Christ at this very moment. Again, the Armenians will say, the body of Christ is the body of Christ, whether you're part of it or not. Yeah, but once I believed, I got put into that body. Amen. And I'm not just in a, a, a marbles in a, a jar. I'm part of that body. Amen. So they, they have this idea that you can, you're, you're, you're in it, but you're not part of it. No, you're part of that body. And if you were to lose your, if you could lose your salvation, which you can't, that body would be broken up. It can't, it can't happen. Jesus is the manna from heaven. He said, your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and they died. But on the bread of life, if you eat of me, you never die. Of course, I'm paraphrasing. But if you could eat of Jesus Christ and die, he's no better than the manna in the Old Testament in the wilderness. They continually ate and died. These Armenians say, you have to continually eat of Christ to be saved. Well, he's no different than regular bread. He said, I'll, right. you're never, never hunger again. Well, well, no no kidding if I continue to eat. Right. I mean, you receive the Holy Spirit at the moment of salvation, at the moment you believe. 
If you had to continue to believe to be saved, when do you receive the Holy Spirit? When you die? Is that? No. It's, it's, it's a moment thing. He said, he's living water. You drink of him, you never thirst. So if you had to continue to drink in order to be saved, like these Armenians say, then he's no different than normal water. Because if you continue to drink normal water, you won't thirst. He promised to be with us unto the end of the world. He didn't put a condition there. These Arminians are always putting conditions where they're not. Amen. So it's, it's possible to sin and die in that condition, and it's possible for a Christian to deny the faith. Now, see, what happens is you always get these Christians that are, are really sold out, you know, and they mean well, and the, they've done a whole lot for the Lord. They've given up everything, and they, they start to uh, think very highly of themselves. And they think that if somebody does something they don't do, then they can't be saved. So I got to thinking about this. I wonder what these people like in uh, the Middle East and uh, North Korea and all these places where you get killed if you're a Christian. I wonder if some of them have the tendency to maybe kind of believe that if you deny the faith under some circumstances, you were never saved to begin with. But... It is possible to be a true believer and deny that you're a true believer. Amen. Remember Paul, he went and he got Christians and it says he compelled them to blaspheme. Or, would you be proud of that? Would you be proud to deny the faith? No, no. But does that mean you're not saved to begin with? Or does that mean you lost your salvation? No. Should you confess Jesus Christ? Of course. Of course. Why, why, why do I have to say that when I'm teaching this? Why, I mean, I would never say that these things are good. But does Calvinism justify sin? Well, no. Nobody says, oh, Calvin, those Calvinists, they just teach that. It's all a bunch of justification for sin. But they say that about internal security. Well, look, if I teach Calvinism and I see you doing that, I say, you know, you know the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. You need to get saved. Well, that kind of justifies it, don't it? I mean, well, I wasn't saved before. I did that. Now I'm going to repent and get saved. And then next time you decide you're going to do it, you're like, well, I'll get saved this time then. Well, it's like that with Arminians. Does nobody, see, th nobody would accuse an Arminian that believes you lose your salvation if you sin of justifying sin. But really, if you think about it, if you believe you, lose your, you can uh, lose your salvation, it's Friday night, I'm going to go out there, I'm going to lose my salvation, and when I get home Saturday morning, I'm going to get converted again. So, if eternal security justifies sins, which it doesn't, then so does Calvinism and Arminianism. I mean, if you can continually keep getting saved over and over, how does that not justify sin? But I'm not going to accuse these people of trying to justify sin like they accuse us of trying to uh, justify sin by believing in eternal security. The believer in sin. Simply, what happens when you sin? Well, you shouldn't have done it. You confess it to God. You agree with God that it was wrong. You shouldn't have done it. You, he provided you a way out, but you did it anyway. You're guilty. Repent of it. Turn from it. That's in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Repentance produces something in a Christian. Change of life. Flesh. If you live after it, you'll die. It's simple, see? <laughs> Uh, spirit, if you lived after it, you'll live. It's very, very, very simple when it comes to the Christian life. There's not a list of do's and don'ts. It's walking after the Spirit, being filled with the Spirit, being yielded to God. And how do we know? By what His Word says. By what His Word says. So God is willing to restore anybody, any Christian that comes to Him, and He's willing to save anybody that comes to Him. I seen on uh, the the group there that uh, there's this guy named Stephen Anderson that believes that uh, if you were a sodomite or you struggled with those thoughts, that you were a reprobate and reprobates can't be saved. The fact is, is whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. Salvation is an open invitation for everyone. Amen. <clears throat> Problem passages. Hebrews 3, 6 talks about we're the house of Jesus Christ if we endure, and that's about the, the 
3, 6, and 14 talks about enduring, and it uses the phrase, the end. Well, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. <laughs> In the Old Testament, in Habakkuk, I believe it's 2, verse 4, it says, the just shall live by his faith. The New Testament, it's quoted as, the just shall live by faith. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7 and 8, it says, they, uh, so that you come, come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who also shall confirm you unto the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. The book of Hebrews, written to Hebrews, during the tribulation. I don't know if Greg... We've never studied Hebrews. Okay. Uh, the book of Hebrews, tribulation, context. People during the tribulation. One thing about the Bible is it's not all for Christians. Amen. You take, there's parts of the book of Isaiah that is written to Gentiles, which, you know, to Egypt, to Assyria, and so forth. Well, the book of Hebrews is written to Hebrews. Can you get something from it? Of course. But when it says you have to endure to the end to be saved, or if you fall away, you're not, you can't be saved again, that's talking about people in the tribulation. But look at 1 Corinthians 1, verse 7 and 8. It says Jesus Christ will confirm you to the end. Amen. Those verses in Hebrews, it's up to you. That's in the tribulation. You won't be in the tribulation. You're here right now. And that's Jesus Christ that's going to confirm you to the end. Hebrews 6, 4 and 6, that's the one we looked at earlier, where it says it's impossible to renew them again with repentance. Look at 2 Corinthians 4. This is a, a, very, this is a good eye-opener showing you that there's different times in history how God deals differently with people. And one of the ways He deals differently with people is the mode or means of salvation. Hebrews, uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 6. Now remember, Hebrews said it's impossible to renew them. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 says, For God, uh, whoa, 16. 16, yeah, okay. Uh, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is what? Renewed day by day. See, that, that promise is for a Christian living now. You'll renew day by day, but during the tribulation, if you take that mark of the beast, you cannot be renewed. That's right. It's not going to happen. And so people will take Hebrews 6 and say, see, if you screw up, you can't get saved again. They say, see, Hebrews 6 or Hebrews 3, you've got to endure to the end. Well, what about 1 Corinthians 1 that says it's God that does it? Colossians 1, 22 and 23, to your right. I we'll won't read all this, but 22 and 23, it says, uh, pick it up in 21. And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Verse 23, if ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. See how people will take that and say, see, if you're removed from the hope of the gospel, you lose your salvation. But look at verse 22 again. He said, present, present you holy, unblameable, and unreprovable. So this is talking about presenting a Christian in a certain state. Look at verse 28. Whom we preach, that's Christ, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Perfect in the Bible has to do with a Christian being mature. Verse 22 and 23 is not saying you have to uh, continue in the faith to be saved. It's saying you have to remain in the faith if you want to be a mature Christian when you stand before Jesus Christ. It's that simple. But they take verse 21 and 22 and 23 and say, see, if you're removed from the hope of the gospel, yeah, see, I mean... But anyway, so they just failed to read verses 24 to 28. Matthew 6, 14 to 15. If I can remember that, we won't have to turn there.
Yeah. Um, he, Jesus says along the lines of, you know, if you forgive men their trespasses, your Heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you don't forgive them, He's not going to forgive you. So in essence, He makes your sins being forgiven based on you forgiving other people. All right, that's a different time. If you read the beginning of Matthew chapter 5, and look how many times the word land or mountain or kingdom or kingdom of heaven appears. The context is when Jesus Christ returns and sets up his millennial kingdom on earth. Things are going to be different during that time. It's not going to be like it is now. It's it, just like it's going to be different during the tribulation. It's not going to be like it is during the millennial. The Sermon on the Mount is aimed at Jewish people living in the millennial kingdom. And so when he says, if you don't forgive people's sin, God's not going to forgive you, that's not talking about a Christian because Colossians 3.13 says, as, Christ is, as God has forgiven you, that's how you're supposed to forgive other people. And the millennial, you have to forgive to be forgiven. And the church, you forgive because you're forgiven. There's a difference. Uh, Matthew 7, 21 to 23. You're familiar. It talks about the people that come to Jesus and say, you know, Lord, Lord, haven't we done many wonderful works in thy name and, uh, you know, bought $65 million jets and all this stuff. <laughs> and, 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 and he says, and, uh, and the Lord will say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Right. Well, Galatians 4, 9 says you're known of God or rather have known of God. So what's that tell me? It tells me right now, as I'm a Christian, God knows me, I know him. So in order for Jesus Christ to say, I never knew you, he would have to be a liar. Jesus Christ is not a liar. This is talking about people who were never saved, obviously. And again, it's the context of the millennial kingdom. Matthew 5, 21 to 22. Uh, Jesus says, if you say to your brother, thou fool, you're in danger of hellfire. What's, what's Jesus do in Matthew 23, 17? He calls them fools. Mm -hmm. What's Paul do in 1 Corinthians 15, 36? Thou fool. Thou fool. He calls them fools. So my question is, Jesus Christ said, if you say to your brother, thou fool, you're in danger of hell, and he turns around and calls them fools, did Jesus Christ go to hell? No, nobody would believe that. It's for a different time. Same with Paul. You can call your brother a fool now. Most of the time, he's worthy of it. <laughs> <laughs> but Ezekiel 18, Ezekiel 18 talks about if a man turns from his wickedness and he starts doing righteousness, his wickedness won't be remembered. But if a man stops doing righteousness and starts doing wickedness, his righteousness won't be remembered and he'll die in his sin. That has to do with Old Testament. Obviously, it's in the Old Testament. Right. Romans 10.4 says Christ is the end of the... Uh, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. So, Ezekiel 18, that has to do with people living under the law, trying to do right. In Luke chapter 1, it says that they were um, perfect and walking in the law, blameless and stuff like that. Paul said, when Jesus Christ returns, he didn't want to be found having mine own righteousness, which is of the law. See, Christ is now the Christian's righteousness. Right. Jesus Christ is never going to turn from righteousness and start doing wickedness. I'm going to heaven on his righteousness, not mine. All these people that want to work their way to heaven or want to try and talk you out of uh, the security of your salvation, they can go to hell all they want, trust in their own righteousness. I'll go to heaven, trust in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. That's the end. And all the people said? Amen. All right, I'm going to pray. Lord, we thank you for being good to us, and uh, Lord, we're thankful for your words and how they can straighten us out. We're thankful, Lord, that uh, we do have that eternal security, uh, but Lord, we're also thankful that uh, you called us. You said, be holy, for I am holy, and uh, Lord, you said, touch not the unclean thing, and you said, Lord, that uh, you give us the grace we need to serve you, so we're thankful for that, and we're thankful, Lord, that we can uh, uh, just count and completely rely on you for our salvation. We don't have to go from day to day wondering if we did good enough. Or, uh, Lord, I, truly in my own ministry, I've seen people tore up over this. And uh, 
uh, just people that uh, are mentally unstable because of it. And uh, Lord, we know it's not it's not Christianity that causes problem, Lord. It's false doctrine. And so, Lord, if uh, if you'd be pleased tonight to help us remember these things, uh, so that we would never get caught up in false doctrine and uh, be off balance and uh, displeasing to you, that'd be great, Lord. We'd appreciate it. And I just pray you get us all home safely and uh, give us a good night rest so we can wake up and. Uh, give you another day. We do thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Simply trusting every day, trusting through a stormy way, even when my faith is small, trusting Jesus that is all. Brightly doth his spirit shine into this poor heart of mine. While he leads, I cannot fall, trusting Jesus, that is all. Singing if my way be clear, praying if my way be drear, if in danger for him call, trusting Jesus, that is all. Trusting him my life shall last, trusting him till earth is past, till his gracious advent call, trusting Jesus, that is all. Trusting as the moments fly, trusting as the days go by, trusting him whate'er befall, trusting Jesus that is all. Amen. <laughs>